Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with China economic analyst Antonio Graceffo and Paz Gomez, researcher at Impunity Observer. They touch on the first female president in Honduras, how that could change diplomatic relations with Taiwan, and how the Chinese regime's economic stake in Latin America ripples over into the U.S. Let's dive in. Well, Antonio, thank you so much for joining us in person. Great to have you back on the show. It's great to be here, Tiffany. And so coming up, Honduras is having a new election, new president, and one of the issues is Taiwan. Honduras is one of the few countries that recognizes Taiwan and has a diplomatic relationship. So there's questions about if that's going to stay. So if it goes either way, what would happen? What would be the big issue? Well, it's interesting that coincidentally the, the new leader of, of Honduras is named Castro, although not a relation to Fidel Castro, but uh, she is known as a socialist. So there's a lot of speculation that she may switch recognition. Um, Taiwan is down to 14 friends, I believe now, including the Vatican State, so 13 countries and, and the Vatican. And losing Honduras would be a big blow. And it's one of the few, uh, there's a few countries in Central America and the Caribbean that are of reasonable size. And then almost all the other friends of Taiwan are tiny, tiny, tiny countries, you know, hundred, hundreds of thousands of people population. So it would be a real blow to Taiwan. And so I think reports are noting that the White House has been kind of pushing Honduras not to cut the tie. So what would China gain if Honduras switches? Well, as soon as they uh, become friends with um, China, with the CCP, they'll get money. Um, they'll probably get Confucius Institutes, they'll get scholarships. Uh, uh, recently, I've done a lot of research on uh, police exchanges. They will kindly, the CCP will kindly train the police of Honduras and they will put CCP police there to help them learn how to police better. Um, they give them these smart city, uh, it's called uh, safe city, safe city programs where they put all these uh, surveillance and facial recognition in their cities and they'll even give them free of charge some CCP people to sit there and help them monitor it. And they've already done this in Latin America, other parts of Latin America. And I mean, this is all, you know, it's, a, it's a long laundry list of things that um, Honduras could get out of the deal. What China gets out of it is every one of these things is one more foothold that they have very close to the American border. Right. So you mentioned the kind of foothold and control that China would have over this area. So how would that impact the United States? Why are we so against it? Well, one thing is we, we don't want China to get close enough to have listening posts uh, where they can do observations and things. So uh, my understanding is that there's one in, in Cuba and it's manned by Chinese troops and it's in Cuba. Um, now, Honduras, if they could put a listening post there, uh, they could observe, you know, how our ships are traveling, our patterns, uh, figure out, because uh, our Navy trains, of course, in the Caribbean, and they could find that out. Also, we're training, uh, we're doing joint exercises with uh, nations that we're friendly with, and so China would be able to observe those more easily. Um, there's so many things they could do if, if they get close. I mean, they, they, they could... Uh, they could have their own people or their agents be human trafficked into the United States through the southern border, for example. I mean, this is already happening, but it would be even easier starting from Honduras. And so you also touched on the economic front, and it seems like, and not just Honduras, but say all of Latin America, China has been investing a lot there. And so what Broadly speaking, what would China gain with all that investment? So one of the things that China is doing that's very clever is that they're going right to the tree. Uh, when you want to find a good apple, you go right to the tree. So one of the things they're doing is they're offering scholarships for students, police, and military. But they're taking junior officers, young people. So they'll go to China, they'll have a good experience, and they'll always, maybe they'll learn to speak Chinese, and then they'll always be somewhat pro-China. So China will slowly and organically grow support in those countries from China. And of course, and they, they produce um, mega projects in these countries uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative and through other programs. So basically, these programs work like this. China will come and build a very highly visible infrastructure project. They will loan the host country the money to pay for the project. The host company, country will then use the money to pay Chinese companies to build the project. And now the host country is on the hook to China. They owe China money. They have to pay interest. And all the money has already come back to China through construction companies. And the projects that China builds are very generally, we, we call them mega projects now, and these are large infrastructure projects which are very visible 
So the average Honduran walks down the street, oh, look at this beautiful shopping mall that China gave us. Look at this, this highway. We didn't have a highway before. China gave us this sports stadium, all this. And um, when we compare the, and, and China calls it aid, which is madness because they're loaning it to the people. They're making a profit. When the U.S. gives aid, it's actually aid. And it's in the millions of dollars or hundreds of millions, whereas China's coming with billions of dollars. So if the average person say, well, China's giving me billions, U.S. is giving me millions, I mean, obviously, you know, I'd rather have billions. And that's what they're getting. They're building this, this goodwill, a foothold, control over the government, uh, agree with us on this U.N. Uh, resolution, and we'll give you some more money and that sort of thing. So it sounds like China's almost buying its influence and, say, power on the world stage that way. Because I think some have also mentioned how much debt these countries have, right? You brought it up, too. It's like, to the U.S., maybe they only have a little debt. To Beijing, they have a lot. And so when, say, big issues come up and the U.S. is like, oh, can you, like, listen to us? They'll be like, no, I have these monetary gains. So what, what would be some ways of maybe stemming that risk? That's, that's a real problem. People always ask me about that, you know. Um, well, if we want to keep these people as friends, we should give them more money than China gives them. It's like, that's not a friend, right? Uh, and I understand people are going to act in what they believe to be their best interest. But obviously taking these high interest loans from China, putting their country on the hook forever, is not in the people's best interest. And that's why we have places like Pakistan, where the people are furious with their government. And the average Pakistani hates China, hates everything about it, their own government you know, uh, puts them on the hook for these. And one of the things about these uh, mega projects is that they create corruption and support corruption. So it was really interesting. I was comparing in Pakistan, for example, the Chinese put, I forgot how many, it was like $20 billion, right? And the U.S. put something like, I don't know, $20 million or $10, $10 million. What did, what did China do? Oh, they built this, they built that. Well, when you're building construction, you're creating opportunities for corruption, cronyism, right? And this is all through the Americas as well. If you're going to build a highway, somebody has to have the contract to build the highway. Someone has to have the contract to put the cement, the, the, the food for the workers, you know. And every step of the way, this is the cousin of the, the president, this is the friend of the cousin, of the, this is the, the, the voting lobby. These people are all given these contracts, and each step of the way, a few dollars seem to just disappear, just go up in smoke. Uh, when, when they've done audits, uh, the big, like the World Bank, big institutions have done audits of these projects. They're dramatically over budget. And that's why, because the government is not taking the best bidder. They're open bidding and they're taking the highest bidder because it's their cousin, you know, and then some money's getting siphoned off. So this is going to happen in Honduras. I mean, this is happening all through the Americas, the countries that have already switched their recognition, and this will happen in Honduras next. And so it sounds like for the U.S. this would be a very pressing issue, and I think last year there was a U.S. congressional hearing on the subject where Beijing's kind of gaining soft power, economic power, all these different leverages. So going forward, do you see there being a shift in the U.S. paying more attention to this issue? I certainly hope so. Um, you know, when, it, when I, was, I was a soldier in the 80s and 90s, so our focus was primarily on Russia, and then number two was Latin America. And, um, you know, at that time, you were having a lot of communist revolutions all through the Americas, and the U.S. was very focused on it. And the U.S. Southern Command used to be a lot larger, it was based out of Panama. And um, we've diminished the size of the, of the Southern Command. We've handed the Panama Canal back to Panama, um, which was a lease agreement, and it's fair to give it back to them. But I think we definitely could have just renegotiated. Um, we didn't have to take it by force or something. I'm not advocating that. But we probably could have, could have negotiated something with them that would give them X amount of money and allow us to maintain the canal. But we didn't. So now you've got Chinese security companies on, on the canal. You've got there's, – there's entire ports in Latin America now that have Chinese security. And um, moving forward, I really hope that the U.S. will switch, its, switch some of its attention to this. And I, and I just believe this – Ukraine and Russia, I mean, it's just, just a real distraction. Um, if you want to worry about that, okay, fine, but let's also spend some time worrying about Latin America. I mean, this is our backyard. I mean, Cuba, you know, you're talking about 90 miles from the U.S. coast, and, and there's, there's Chinese military there. There's Chinese military in Tierra del Fuego, you know, in, uh, in Patagonia and uh, southern uh, Argentina. You've got um, a listening post, a, a space uh, station that's being manned by the PLA. We need to shift our attention to that area. So you mentioned the proximity, how close Latin America is to 
America. And so what would be some other areas of concern? Like why should the U.S. care what happens there? Well, I mean, that's a, that's the primary one. And then the big picture, if you look at a very macro picture, uh, voting rights in, in the EU, every country, I'm sorry, in the UN, every country gets one vote regardless of the size of the country. So Taiwan was the one actually who invented that strategy a number of years ago. They're like, oh, I can get all these Kiribati and all these little tiny countries, you know, as friends. It's easy to get them as friends. And then you got one vote in the UN. But that's what China's doing. I mean, they're setting up these voting blocks. When uh, the Xinjiang uh, proposals for uh, human rights in Xinjiang were brought before the UN, it was voted down by a group of 60 countries, all of whom were, uh, you know, BRI members, all of them owed money to China. So China's just building, it's like a politician running for office. It sounds like China's buying those votes and then impacting other people without them even realizing it. So from, say, maybe the average Joe point of view, is there anything they could do to try and help? I, as always, you need to petition your lawmakers. You need to uh, bring this to your senators, your congresspeople, congressional representatives. You need to make, make them understand that this is very important and they need to address it. Now, a back door that you can use as an argument is that there's a lot of U.S. cities that have a sister city arrangement with the city in Central or South America. And most cities don't do very much with it, but somewhere in the city is a little plaque, you know, where the sister city of whatever in Peru. Uh, Use that. <laughs> Go to your mayor and say, listen, you know, that city that we're sister city, they're, they're getting taken over by communists. Maybe we can do something about it. But yeah, we need to get the word out. I think that's the big thing. The media is distracting us. And, and again, they're distracting us with Russia and, and Ukraine. I'm not saying it's not important, but this is very important and very immediate, you know, and, and it's in our backyard. And because of the situation at the southern border, you know, all sorts of Chinese agents and operatives are coming up through the southern border, and that needs to be stopped. And is there anything else you'd like to add? Latin America matters. <laughs> China matters. China is the, poses the biggest threat. You know, I'm veteran in the Cold War, and I'll tell you, China poses a greater threat than, than Russia ever did. Russia never had the money. They never had the influence. Nothing. I mean, China, China is co-opting organizations all over the world at, at the very low level and at the very high level, and this absolutely needs to be addressed. Well, Antonio, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, Tiffany. It was great seeing you. And joining us now from Ecuador, Paz Gomez. Paz, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Good morning, Tiffany. Great to have he to be here. And I'm glad to talk about, uh, I don't know, more Chinese influence in Latin America. So a big story right now is the new president in Honduras, and one big part of that is Taiwan. So going forward, is Honduras going to switch diplomatic ties to Beijing? And if so, what would that mean? Why is it so significant? Yes, well, Xiomara Castro, that is the new the president-elect for Honduras, told during her campaign that she was interested in shifting uh, diplomatic relations from Taiwan to uh, China. And this was especially related uh, to, the, to her interest to finance ambitious infrastructure projects. Uh, and of course, the money is in Beijing. Um, she also told you in her campaign that China will open more economic opportunities, will open the, the chance to have more vaccines for COVID-19. And uh, this was like her first announcement. Then uh, immediately... Uh, people from the U.S. government uh, talked with her and uh, trying to persuade him, persuade her and her team to uh, think about the relationships with Taiwan. Because, of course, if you go with Beijing, you cut the other relationships with Taiwan. And uh, basically, after, after that, around December 10, the, the team from Xiomara Castro told that they were uh, thinking about what to do, that they were not trying just to cut cut off relationships with Taipei. Uh, and this is mainly related, I think, to the fact that, of course, um, cutting the relations with Taipei would also affect the relations with the United States. And the Honduran business elite would also have uh, a say there. They would, of course, uh, prefer to have relationships with the United States. Now, it seems on the U.S. side, the White House has been suggesting Honduras to not switch diplomatic ties. So how would this impact the whole relationship with the U.S.? In, during the last uh, five years, 
there, Taiwan has lost uh, important uh, allies in the in Central America and the Caribbean, such as Panama, the, Rep the Dominican Republic, uh, recently Nicaragua. Of course, it is right now more like a, di a dictatorship there. Uh, and I think that in this in this context, the United States wa is more worried about uh, losing all the the allies from from for taiwan and that china gains these allies so uh in in this sense um, the united states saw as an emergency to try to suggest uh, the new the new administration the coming administration to uh consider the relationships with taiwan um, Honduras is, an, is a key ally for the United States because of all the context related to migration. Uh, in this moment, Hon uh, Honduran migrants are one of the most huge, uh, large groups that arrive to the southern border of the United States. And uh, of course, as, as the United States has more influence in China, it, sorry, in Honduras, they have more... Um, chance to say to persuade them like uh we will give more cooperation funds if you do this or we can make some things uh, like diplomatic ties and diplomatic strategies in in which the united states can uh, control and try to shape what uh, economic and migration policy is honduras taking but if china gains more um influence in the in Honduras and you the, and the United States lost it of course it is going to be more difficult and of and the results on migration would be uh, more difficult to manage from the United States so from the Honduras point of view what benefit would they gain by switching to Beijing what is going to happen is that basically Honduras would have a more political approach with China. I don't think that in the first um, in the first scenario uh, Honduras has a lot to win uh, from the commercial side because in that sense Honduras has uh, the United States is the main ally for Honduras and um, even Taiwan has more uh, importance more relevance in commercial activity than China has for Honduras. So you touched on the economic benefit that Honduras would gain by switching to Beijing. So expanding this out to all of Latin America, it seems the Chinese communist regime has invested a lot there. And just last year here in the U.S., there was a congressional hearing on kind of the dangers around that, say the soft power and economic leverage. So going forward, how do you see this playing out? Yes, well, right now, um, China is investing in infrastructure projects in several countries. Around 19 Latin American countries have ongoing projects of infrastructure. And this is part of the global strategy from China that is uh, to become the superpower of this manufacture and infrastructure development. Uh, by doing this, China has... A, can gain some kind of power, of influential power in the region and of course in, in the world if we extrapolate this. And, uh, and, uh, and also since China wants one of the advantages or or benefits that, that, that China has is basically this manufacturing uh, sector and industry. Uh, basically by doing this, China is also Exporting these services uh, provide a, basically a committing countries to uh, become dependent of their of of Chinese uh, service providing uh, these these um, manufacturing sectors. So uh, this this would be like the direct effect. In in the meantime, we're going to see that. Uh, these infrastructure projects would need maintenance, would need uh, further developments to increase productivity and things like that. And of course, the logical uh, provider would be the Chinese companies that were uh, that were already involved in these projects. Um, while doing these infrastructure projects, China also provides credits. 
because uh, or Latin American countries do not do not have the liquidity to finance these projects uh, at once. So uh, this also ties the countries with China. And in the case that some of them default, uh, the what 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 could happen is that China gain more control of the management of these projects. And of course, loans are going to be ex more and more expensive in that sense. Uh, so that would be like the economic consequence if uh, if countries default. And finally, uh, the other the other consequence is that. Uh, as China gains more influence in these kind of projects in the region, um, they are also kind of uh, removing key points for the United States. Uh, not because the United States had been intervening uh, like explicitly in the countries, but because at the end, if if something happens in a geopolitical situation. Uh, the, the logical allies of the United States was the Latin, were the Latin American countries. If they have a commitment with other countries, it will, it, it will be more difficult for these countries to say, for example, Honduras, in the, in the case that they decide to go with China, uh, it is going to be more difficult to say, uh, yeah, I logically support the United States, I logically support um, the, 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 the Republican democratic system, because they have uh, some commitments with China. And, and currently, this is happening in Honduras, uh, even if they are not uh, having explicit relations with China. According to the, to the World Bank, right now, Honduras has 4% of its external debt with China and just 0.01% of the ex external debt with the United States. So those kind of things, of course, in influence at the moment of taking uh, decisions in the diplomatic realm. And that is going to happen with the rest of Latin American countries. Well, Paz, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, Tiffany. Great to be here. And for those just tuning in, that was today's special episode with China economic analyst Antonio Graceffo and Paz Gomez, researcher at Impunity Observer. Thanks for watching and see you next time.